everyone, and welcome to the event with Professor Ann Tickner. On behalf of the Center for International Security Studies and the Department of Government and International Relations, welcome. Thanks for coming. I know this is a really busy time of year, um, and students are trying to study. Uh, graduate students are trying to get marking done, and staff are also trying to get marking done and wrap up the semester, so we really appreciate uh, we actually had to move the, the location of this event um, because of the overwhelming response. So um, thank you for your attendance. It's a great honor to have Professor Ann Tickner here with us, who and I think, uh, as many of you will know, um, is sort of undisputedly one of the founders of what we now talk about as feminist international relations. It's difficult to actually write an introduction for a Professor Tickner. I found it, I found myself reading through biographies and reading through sort of the acknowledgments of her book and the books in the beginning of, of this book that we'll focus on during the talk. Um, but I think, as I've said before, um, if, if there are some students who only read one feminist international relations reading, which unfortunately that happens a lot in, in different introductory courses, Often it's uh, Professor Tickner's uh, response to Hans Morgenthau's Realist Principles. And certainly that was my for first uh, reading in Feminist International Relations. And I remember um, distinctly uh, reading the first world, words, international politics is a, a man's world, a world of power and conflict in which warfare is a privileged activity. And I really remember that those words actually changed the way that I thought about international relations from that moment on. And we were, we've been talking about how um, scholars come to feminist international relations. And for those of you who've read um, this most recent book, uh, you get a really good uh, introduction to how Anne uh, came to feminist international relations. And we've been sharing some interesting and funny stories about how uh, other scholars come to know this international relations. So maybe we'll come back to that today. Um, but uh, in addition to the Morgenthau reading, which um, again, I think is probably the most um, assigned reading in feminist international relations, uh, Anne is really known um, as, as being one of the founders of uh, Feminist IR. She did her PhD at Brandeis uh, under the supervision of Robert Keohane and sub subsequently had some great uh, published debates with uh, Robert Keohane on methodology and feminist international relations. She spent 15 years as a professor of IR at the University of Southern California and there with her late husband, Hayward Alker, were really key in establishing a program that attracted some of the best and top critical IR scholars. Um, she was president of the International Studies Association in 2006 to 2007. Um, and despite rumors that she retired from USC, um, since her so-called retirement, she's put out two books. She edits a series at Oxford University Press. She travels more every year, <coughs> attending conferences, giving lectures, uh, mentoring students, reading um, postgraduate thesis, theses, uh, being on, on committees. Uh, she's busier now in retirement than most of us uh, dream to be at the peak of our career. Uh, recently, I think it's, it's worth noting that, um, and many of you will know that, um, in 2011, she was ranked one of the top scholars having the greatest impact on the IR discipline in the last 20 years from the TRIP survey. She's been named as one of uh, the key 50, uh, 50 thinkers in IR. Um, and uh, so today we're, we're focusing on the question, what has feminism done for international relations? But really through the lens of uh, her most recent book, A Feminist Voyage Through International Relations, which Anne has um, selected some of her key readings and also updated them and, and given some uh, current reflections. So um, we thought we would kind of just get started with Anne talking a little bit about the motivation for the book, uh, what it was like after 25 years in a, in a uh, career to go back and go through some of your work 
and think about what feminism has done for international relations and whether anything has changed. And I was looking at um, not only that first quote that I read you, but um, a subsequent quote uh, in her, uh, in the most, one of her most famous readings, the, the reading on Hans Morgenthau, where she says, um, since I believe that there's something about this field, international relations, that renders it particularly inhospitable and unattractive to women, uh, I intend to focus on the nature of the discipline itself, rather than on possible strategies to remove barriers to women's access to high policy positions. As I've already suggested, the issues that are prioritized in foreign policies are issues with which men have had a special affinity. Moreover, if it is primarily men who are describing these issues and constructing theories to explain the workings of the international system, might we not expect to find a masculine perspective in the academic discipline also? If this were so, then it could be argued that the exclusion of women has operated not only at the level of discrimination, but also through a process of self-selection, which begins with the way in which we are taught about international relations. And I think it's really interesting that this quote is as relevant in some ways today as it was when she wrote the, those words. So uh, with that, I think uh, I would just ask you to um, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Tickner and, and look forward to hearing some of the comments and questions from, from you in the audience. Well, thank you. Thank you all for at such a difficult time of the year, both in terms of uh, your general lives and stress levels and also the weather, which I probably, probably doesn't help either. But anyway, uh, it is a bit hot today, but it's, it's lovely for me as we're moving into winter where I come from. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm always, always thrilled to come to Australia because for the kind of work I do, I think it's probably uh, the most hospitable place that one can go. There are more feminist scholars here than anywhere, and um, not only feminist scholars, but uh, critical scholars more generally, which are getting scarcer and scarcer inside the United States. There's been a huge uh, brain drain of critical scholars in international relations out of the United States. So it's, it's always wonderful for me to be here, and I appreciate Megan's invitation, and she's taking such great care of me. Enjoy seeing Megan and all the wonderful friends that I've made here over many years. Um, uh, Megan asked me uh, to um, start uh, by saying a little, just a bit about the book, uh, but also she asked me to start by saying a little bit about the origins of uh, feminist IR and and what motivated me to get involved. Before I start thinking about the question of what has changed, in one way I think everything has changed in that a remarkably short space of 25 years we've gone from really no literature in the field. And when I say that, I'm not talking about women's studies, and, and I'm just talking about uh, international relations specifically. And, um, work emerges out of the discipline of international relations. We've gone from nothing in terms of feminism to just huge, huge and wonderful uh, literature with, with a lot of creative and very un unusual kind of work. And it, it's, been, it's been great. But then, uh, on the other hand, we could also say that uh, it's a struggle and we've got a long way to go. And, I always feel heartened in Australia because you do have courses that offer this perspective in universities. In the United States, you are certainly not guaranteed to have courses that bring up gender at all in any kind of international relations uh, training, uh, which is still rather depressing. So we can say that in some sense everything has changed, and then in some sense not, not much has changed in a lot of places. Anyway, so I just want to say something very quickly about the origins of feminist IR and why I got involved, and then we'll just a little bit about the book, and then we're going to uh, move to the uh, questions from you and Megan and sent me ahead of time, very thoughtful questions, which I have had time to think about a bit. 
Um, uh, this uh, sort of whatever we want to call it, some discipline, I don't know, of international relations um, is relatively new. It got started in the late 1980s, so it's about 25 years. So, so I don't actually have to claim extreme old age in order to say that I was there at the foundation. Um, uh, but anyway, um, what was really amazing about it was that it, it began, and I think it was probably had something to do with the end of the Cold War, and, and which opened up the field to new issues and also new ways of thinking. 1989 was the year that Joseph Lepid uh, wrote uh, the third debate piece about uh, proclaiming a post-positivist era, which is not exactly what has happened, but nevertheless there was a sort of opening up of knowledge and how we construct knowledge. But what was amazing uh, from a point of view was that all these, many of the same ideas sort of happened in different parts of the world, uh, in Australia, in uh, the UK, and the United States. And now I'm talking particularly about uh, feminism. Uh, one of the very early conferences on this subject uh, uh, was convened by Fred Halliday at the London School of Economics in 1988. Uh, uh, it was then called Women. He, he taught a, a first master's course for women in international relations, of, of which I was able to participate. And then um, in uh, 1988 and 19, uh, 1989 and 1990, there were, were two conferences in the U.S. that brought together international relations theory uh, theorists and feminist scholars to talk about uh, uh, sort of getting the two perspectives together. And Coincidentally, at that time, I happened to find, and somebody brought to my attention an article um, in the um, uh, in a law journal. It wasn't a feminist journal um, by Hilary Charlesworth and her co-author. She's a, a, a feminist international lawyer now. Now at the end, you probably are probably familiar with her, who who wrote a, the founding article on the, the gendering of international law. And, and so many of the things she said were so similar. I also discovered uh, Ginny Petman's article in the Australian Journal of International Affairs, where she presented a lot of the same ideas about the uh, gender nature of the field. So it was really interesting, I think, that you know all these ideas seem to sort of bubble up at about, about the same uh, time. Uh, the conference that I organized um, in 1990 produced the book uh, Gendered States, edited by uh, Spike Peterson, which is one of the kind of early books. And we're actually going to have a, a workshop at Monash um, reflecting back on, on, uh, on that book and the sort of work that it started. So it, 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 it sort of, it, it's amazing that so many people were having so many similar ideas at the same time. Why did I get involved? Um, this is not what I started out doing. I, I was a, a conventional, well, I, I was never really conventional. I was a bit uneasy with the discipline, but I was uh, identified as a uh, Cohen student, a student of international political economy. My first job, I was responsible for teaching what we then we know the global economy, the international political economy courses, nothing to do with gender. I never really thought about gender. I taught a lot of um, introductory IR classes. And at that time, we were really tasked to teach a lot, certainly in the United States, about security studies. And I used to throw around nuclear missile threat weights and all these wonderful terms, you know, with, with I don't know, it never struck me that there was any, any problem with that at all. Uh, I wasn't one kind of very reflective about it, but of course about nuclear strategy and being rather horrified and fascinated at the same time. But it began uh, to occur to me when I started teaching that there were no women authors that I could assign to the students, and nor were women really ever mentioned. Cynthia Enloe's famous early question uh, where are the women, which she always asks. And I remember she came to one of my early classes and, 
in and she went up to a student and took her textbook and she always would look in the index and see if she could find women or gender and she would never find either. And so, you know, there the weren't any, there weren't any professional meetings. The International Standing Association was just so different in those days. Very, very few uh, women. So one felt really kind of out of place in some sense. What I also noticed was that many of my female students felt somewhat out of place, which I thought was rather odd. They would often come to my office and say they were rather uneasy with all this sort of, they said, I'm not going to do as well in the cause as so-and-so, and they would name just to me privately a sort of what I call self-defined weapons expert who would sit in the front row, you know, and, and challenge me as a woman my ability to talk them about things like nuclear strategy and so forth, you know, and, and invariably they did very well, but they just didn't feel comfortable, they didn't feel very connected. And so that was really how I got into feminism. I began to think, well, what, what, what's going on here? What, what's the problem? Um, there was really nothing to read. Um, there was some really strong women in the military, women involved, but were not specifically within the context of international relations theory. So where do you start? I just happened uh, to pick up a book by a, um, a feminist, uh, she's a physicist actually, she has the history of science, Evelyn Fox Keller, and she wrote a book called Reflections on Gender and Science, which natural scientists think is really nonsense, but um, it's a wonderful book talking about the gendering of science, which is, is really, is quite extraordinary. But I sort of thought, well, if she, you know, the sort of questions that science asks, Sandra Hardy does the same kind of work, you know, why do we ask these particular questions? What are the ways in which we answer them? And she argued that, that uh, science since modern science, since its founding in the 17th century, has been a very, what she called a masculine endeavor. And of course, there were very few uh, early women scientists men ever mentioned, although now we're finding out a lot of women actually have had a lot of scientific ideas and have been behind or, you know, doing the same things as, as men, but they never got any recognition. So that was, that was just happen, happening to read that book, really just sort of, piqued my interest and thinking, well, you could actually apply all that to international relations theory. So I would say that my trajectory, while yes, I always bear in mind the question, where are the women, but my interest really is piqued by the gendering of international theory and by the fact that it is a very sort of masculine uh, Way, way of, of doing theory, and I don't just mean that men do it, women do it too, and I, in the time we have, I, I can't really sort of um, explain that very well, but that I, I don't, haven't done, a lot of my students have done imperial field work on out, but I, I don't do that kind of work myself. I, and I always feel that my role has been to stay uh, rather close to the discipline, because my goal is really to speak uh, to students of international relations, not all to people who already are converted or who do gender studies. I want international relations students to see the world differently, and that's sort of the way I've taught. And a lot of my students will say to me at the end of the course, I did a course called Gender and Global Issues for many years, this has really changed the way I think about the world. And that's sort of where I aim. And I also think that my Morgan Thor piece and others is, I mean, IR theorists obviously find it strange, don't agree with it, but they can sort of handle it because it's coming out of a place uh, that, that, uh, that it is familiar to them. And so others do do it differently, but that is kind of the path uh, that I have uh, chosen. Um, I also think my training in peace studies has sort of trained me to um, kind of, I, I respect other modes of thought in international relations, even ones that I don't agree with. And I think it's very important uh, to show respect, to show understanding, uh, and to try to have conversations, which is what I have always done, not always successfully, but that's sort of been my goal. Um, the book, I don't know, do 
little bit too much. Um, the book was a wonderful opportunity for me to really kind of reflect on, it sort of makes more sense to kind of look back and, and see, you know, what you've done in terms of being able to sort of put it into different sort of categories. And the book has three uh, parts to it. Um, the first one, um, some of my earlier, or not, not exclusively all earlier, but mostly earlier, uh, pieces in the 90s, um, introducing uh, gender, uh, call introducing gender and women into international relations. And here I, I talk about the, how theories are on gender. We talk about security studies, and peace studies, which surprisingly enough, peace studies has not been very hospitable. I mean, has not been very open or interested in uh, feminist work, and in some ways that kind of surprises me more than security studies. I can kind of sort of, I can sort of accept that it's tough for security studies to take on board, but peace studies hasn't done much uh, with it either. And then I have a chapter on um, international political economy, and another one on the environment. I, my first book had a, a whole section on uh, environmental thinking, and I sorry I sort of haven't got back to that because I think that that is really quite interesting. I think feminists have tended to stay away uh, from what is called ecological thinking because you know it sort of comes out as being sort of weak, feminized. I mean, you know, a lot of the environmental movement, greens, and tree hugging people. I mean, all of these terms are all associated. Uh, with the feminine, and that's what I mean by gender. I mean, even if we don't use gender terms explicitly, we're gendering things in a way that, you know, national security is strong and powerful and rational, and you don't have to mention gender, but you, you, you know the coding. And then, and I think the coding for peace, for environment, for these things tends to be very feminized, and this is, is really bad, I and mean, it's, it's bad for these fields. We need to somehow, you know, value what we see as feminized to the same extent. Um, but as I was writing all, and these have been well written over years, the, the sort of trying to address the different fields within international relations and showing how they're all gendered. It, it, and this sort of, and my, Key goal, which is all, has always been uh, conversations, conversations with people who don't do gender, trying to have them understand what we're trying to do. It, it sort of gradually began to occur to me that the issue was really never accepting that, well, yes, we should be talking about women, we should be paying more attention to women's issues. Um, and when I say they, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish anybody, I'm talking about people who don't think in gender categories, but they sort of say, well, yes, I, I, we think that's the important, it's really important that you, we think about women and we broaden our horizons, but the problem is the way that you do it, and that has really come to me as being the key stumbling block. I think it's more of a stumbling block in the United States where uh, sort of positivist, rational choice methodologies are still so very, very dominant. Um, but how we construct our knowledge, that has been, I think, the key stumbling block. And it came to me sort of slowly that, you know, everything I was doing was rather sort of historical, sociological. I, w I was using sort of frameworks that don't, didn't come from my IR training. And so that, uh, made me realize that it's really these epistemological and methodological issues that are m the most problematic, I think, in, in having any kind uh, of conversations. And I would be interested in your reactions because I think uh, Australian international relations is, is more open to uh, critical and uh, post-positivist methodologies. Um, so, the second part is really about my conversation about methodology. It's not time sequential. It also started in the 1990s. Uh, uh, 97, I wrote my first article in the International Studies Quarterly, 
of holding just don't understand, which is in this book. I think that was probably the only the second article that ISQ had ever published on anything to do with gender or women. I think Lillian had one previously. Um, and subsequent, and so in the subsequent of issue ISQ, they commissioned a little forum around this, and then I was allowed to respond to the forum. And one of the uh, people who wrote for the forum was uh, Robert Cohane, and he made that kind of argument that you know you're asking interesting questions, but you you got to get the right methodology, i.e., sort of. Uh, his, his version of science hypothesis that where are your hypotheses? Where is your research program? I and mean, this was kind of the way in which he had uh, critiqued my uh, article. So I wrote another piece in ISQ, kind of responding to that, uh, or what is your research program, in which I really said that I, I can't answer those questions in the terms that you are asking me to answer them. And that has always been a really big problem. And I, I still, I, I'm still not, I think I have resolved it for myself, but I'm not going to say more about it now. But feminists ask different questions, but they go about answering them in different ways. And if you ask certain theoretical questions, you, you have different methodologies for answering them by the nature of the question. But that's very hard uh, for neopositors to understand. And I say we're rather dominated by them in the United States. They just <laughs> don't get that. And um, I still have that conversation with Go Amy just on the panel uh, of launching this book uh, just before I came here. And we had exactly the same conversation. And, so yeah, it's, he's, he's really a good friend of mine. He's a very nice person. But uh, we have this same conversation. You're not doing theory yet, you know? And um, anyway, so I think I have resolved that myself. And the um, other piece in this book about methodology um, is called uh, Dealing with Difference. And for me, that's sort of it. Uh, I. I then, uh, I'm, I'm sort of beyond trying to defend or, or sort of answer back to questions that I just think, they, they just don't, the, the answer just doesn't work for the kind of question that you're being asked. Um, for, for that piece which was written for a Millennium Conference where the, the, uh, the title was uh, Conversations Across Paradigms, um, I, I sort of resolved it by saying, you know, there are just different ways of doing theory, and I, one has to accept that. And I think a very important book uh, for me in doing that was um, uh, the uh, new book by Patrick Jackson, um, where he talks about different um, uh, uh, theories. I wrote the so the Conduct of Inquiry um, in International Relations is, is an excellent book, and he talks about four ways of doing science, which was one, and he talks a, a lot about what he calls the um, reflexive tradition, and he actually cites a lot of feminist work in that. Patrick and I taught a theory course at American um, University a year or two ago, and um, I think that my kind of uh, theoretical sensibilities fit very well in what Patrick calls a reflexive tradition. And I, I think I think he does a very good job in the book of talking about the fact that all these uh, these are all useful, but they're all science. And for me, that's helped me sort of say, well, I'm doing science too. A lot of feminists don't want to say they're doing science, but just in this particular context, it's, it's been very uh, useful for me. So I think I'm sort of uh, finished with all of that. So part three of the book uh, takes me off in uh, crazy and new directions, which I think is kind of where I situate myself uh, now. Uh, written after the sort of new security agenda, the post uh, 
9-11 years when we uh, had to start about thinking, I mean, we the field about all kinds of new things like religion, and I have a chapter in this book on religion and how you certainly can't uh, explain religious motivations using rational choice theory. Um, I actually tried to give that paper in front of a lot of rational choice people who just didn't believe me. I mean, but, you know, didn't need rational choice to understand religion, but anyway. Um, and I also started, I started to think more about uh, race and imperialism. Um, race and imperialism have been really neglected, I think, in the mainstream of international relations. So that's sort of uh, um, where I'm kind of heading uh, now. My latest book, which is not in this book, is on indigenous knowledge, from which I think we can learn a great deal. And, um, so I'm, uh, so it was also exciting me to come to Australia because there are a number of wonderful um, indigenous scholars here at the indigenous center of our nation. So I, you know, I, I always get lots of new ideas. Um, but just to sort of sum on what comes partly out of the third part, I've always been concerned with the issues around knowledge and power. Uh, whose knowledge actually gets heard? Um, and whose knowledge gets legitimated? And that seems to me is uh, really uh, the uh, key issue, and it's a really important issue for uh, feminists and other critical scholars. It was the subject of my um, ISA presidential address, which was somewhat a uh, shake-up for people who are not accustomed to think about uh, knowledge and power and how we see some knowledge is legitimate and others are not. Um, but clearly, how we construct the world, how we teach about the world, has, for our students, has an enormous effect on how we act in the world and how, how we construct our own worlds. And that's something that I, I think is, is terribly important. And with that in mind, I one the last chapter in this book goes back and looks at IR's uh, early foundational stories. How do we start sort of in the kind of stereotypical uh, discussion of the discipline. We started in the 17th century where everything wonderful happened. The Europeans got them into nation states and the nation state system was gradually globalized and all good things happened. And we don't hear, I mean, that's sort of the traditional West Bengal narrative. We don't hear much about those who were colonized, those who were oppressed. Um, what was happening to women in the 17th century. So I, I went back and sort of started looking um, at some of the other side and those others who have uh, never been talked about, whose voices have never been heard. And I think that's sort of what I've been doing ever since. And kind of indigenous knowledge is sort of pushing me a little bit further uh, along that path. They have some wonderful, I'm not, studying indigenous people, I'm studying their knowledge and they have so much uh, to tell us, but how it doesn't get heard, how does it get legitimated? I, I don't know, it's almost, it's certainly harder than uh, getting feminism heard too. But anyway, that's sort of a summary of, of my own voyage and where I started and where I'm going and I have to say that I've had so much wonderful input from so many wonderful people along the way. This is true. Feminism in IR has been truly a collective effort.